Hello, I'm Anna Smith and thank you for listening to Girls on Film. This episode is a special one. Our first live event after lockdown at the Latitude Festival. Many festivals were of course cancelled this year, but Latitude went ahead and we were thrilled to be there. We had a blast. Enjoy the show. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello, Latitude. How are you? Hello, welcome to Girls on Film. My name's Anna Smith. I'm a film critic and broadcaster and host of Girls on Film, funnily enough. Um, Can you give me a cheer if you've heard of the podcast before? Yes, one or two, thank you, listeners. Um, And thank you, everyone else, for joining us. Just to explain, in that case, Girls on Film has been going for about two years. It's a fun feminist film podcast. We like to prove that fun and feminism can go together. We like to get analytical about films. And we do occasionally have men on the podcast if they've done some great feminist work in film. However, our main focus is on female film critics and female filmmakers. And we like to champion them and have fascinating conversations. So today, we've got some very special guests for you. I'm going to be speaking to the actor and director, Kerry Fox, who's the star of 90s classic Shallow Grave and recently Billy Piper's modern classic Rare Beasts and I'm also going to be inviting onto the stage Eliana Jay who is our assistant producer on Girls on Film and has some great insight into working in the industry if there's anyone here who's interested in getting into film this might be the podcast for you so Latitude may I ask you to welcome to the stage the very fabulous Kerry Fox <laughs> hello Kerry Oh, hello, hello, hello. Hello. Oh, Kerry, welcome. Oh, thank you. Oh, you got a little whistle there. <laughs> That's a good way to start. <laughs> Kerry. You don't mind wolf whistles. <laughs> We're modern feminists. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> We're also older, rarer. <laughs> it's, it's always a treat now, isn't it? I used to object to it, but now it's the compliment. I've never objected. <laughs> You're always happy with it. I can do a it. really good one myself. You ready? Oh, go on. Everyone do one. Whoa, that was amazing, Kerry. <laughs> okay, that wasn't bad either. I love that we started a feminist podcast with wolf whistles. I never, did, never thought that was going to happen. But um, <laughs> Now, Kerry, um, we last had you on the podcast. Gosh, I think it was the last live episode we did in March 2020 for International Women's Day. And that, you know, a lot of things have gone on since then. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, And I'm just back from the Cannes Film Festival, and I thought of you because you've worked with Jane Campion twice, and she was the first and only woman for a very long time to win the top award at Cannes, which is the Palme d'Or. And finally, this year, another woman won. Yes. Long time later. Fantastic, yeah. I know, and when Jane Campion won, uh, they wouldn't even give it to her by herself. She had to share it. So, you know... It's crazy that it's taken this long, like many, many years, for another woman to win. But when you guys eventually get to see Julia Ducourneau's film Titane, it is a complete trip. It is violent, it's crazy, it's outrageous, all sorts. But Kerry, let's talk about your work. (laughs) So you have moved from acting into directing recently. Um, I have really enjoyed watching your short film Topping Out. Um, Will you explain a little bit about this short film? Because it's not often on Girls on Film we feature something with two men in it and no women. But I think it is actually very relevant to us. Okay, so I have made, uh, directed a short film called Topping Out, which uh, is about two Irish blokes on scaffolding. And there are a number of reasons I made it. Uh, One was I wanted to really challenge myself. So I shot something that was on scaffolding 13 stories high. (laughs) And, you know, sometimes in the past I've had a little bit of a, you know, vertigo situation. But it was fine. I dealt with that, clearly. And also I wanted to, um, to be honest, 
It's, it's about these two mates. One's older, one's younger. Um, one's going through a bit of a, the older one's going through a bit of a crisis. He's feeling sort of unloved in his, and unsuccessful. And the younger one is very, very boyish and um, young, like, like younger than my son, you know, he's, he's only 18. And the beautiful uh, Ferdia Walsh Pilo, who was the lead in um, Sing Street, plays that character. And my darling partner, Mo Dunford, plays the older man who um, has, you know, been a scaffolder for years and is something of a, a guiding light to this younger guy. Otto Anton. That's a fucking good word. You know what it means? It sounds like an LTD. What? If you have unprotected sex, you can get uh, an auto antonym, like an LTD. An STD? Yeah. Yeah, that's all. That's all I was right. An auto antonym, Toby, is a word that means the opposite of itself. What? Oh, no, I, I wanted to explore male vulnerability to, because, to be honest, I'm so sick of seeing fake male vulnerability on screen. I've, there's a sort of certain... Uh, it's, it's, it's this very naive way to say it, but it's sort of gesture that that overtakes males actors when they try to show that they're being really emotional and really truthful and they, they, they really have to um, make sure that they're seen. There's a sort of, I always feel there's a self-awareness to male performance and I just felt very strongly that I, I wanted to give actors the opportunity and myself the opportunity and also to explore what men are really like when they are vulnerable because I find them to be really changeable and inexplicable and erratic and irrational when they feel hurt or upset and and it's a really difficult thing for a woman to understand obviously we understand when our own sex are, are, are vulnerable and hurting and because we recognize in ourselves but, but I think for a woman to try and really um, get to grips with that and to take it on is something that I, I don't feel I've really seen. Um, so that's what I wanted to, to do in my film. And luckily, Emma thinks I did. <laughs> I did, totally. That's why as soon as I saw it, I thought we have to get Carrie back on because I agree. I think so often you see, you know, visions of male vulnerability, which are these kind of showboating Oscar speeches of them crying or yeah, having a big moment. But actually, it's much more complex than that. And it's to do with mental health. But it is also perhaps to with expectations that are put on both men and women. And women are allowed to be more vulnerable. You know, there are a lot of things working against us as women, of course, in the way we're brought up. But I think a lot of men face a lot of problems. And it's only recently that male mental health is something that's being talked about more. And I think it's really interesting the, the themes that come up in your film without spoilers um, but jealousy is a huge one but also you know not being able to talk about that and then the, the sense of you know feelings bubbling up underneath and having to explode in some inappropriate way and not being able to control your emotions I think that a lot of men really um, experience that when they when they feel upset or hurt they can't they, they don't know how to channel it they don't know how to let it out uh, and they, so they become, you know, sometimes violent, sometimes heaving, sobbing, sometimes um, shut down, so off angry, obviously, is, you know, one of the big ones. Um, and, I, and I just wanted to put that on film for myself. And, and the reason I chose to make it um, on scaffolding was because I just wanted to show that I could really fucking direct <laughs> because, you know, I have been making films for fucking 35 years and I've worked with some of the best directors and I know every sort of lens, every light, every, every angle, every, you know, and I wanted to prove that that was just so easy with me. And I'll tell you a really great thing about it. Everybody who I asked to work on it with me immediately jumped up and said yes. And my DOP was the focus puller on an angel at my table and we worked together 30, 
five years ago and I wrote to him and said, would you like to, because I always knew, I always knew when we worked together that we connected, we were very, very close when we were working together, because as an actor, I find one of the most important people on set is the focus puller. Do you guys know who, what that job is or what that job entails? Do you want okay. to explain it just in case? Yeah. yeah. So, and I started working on actual film, but focus pullers are still used even though we're all in digital. And, and on film, they used to be the person who pulled everything into focus. And they used to be, they used to watch the performance, watch the actors, and make sure you were sharp and in focus, you know, by looking. But now, of course, they have video screens so they can see exactly what they're looking at. But, um, but they watch performance, they know performance, they see performance, and they, they're working in tune with the performer. And I had worked so closely with him on you know, this incredible piece of work, which was the film An Angel at My Table, which Jane Campion directed in 1989. Um, and, 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 I, and I wanted him, I knew, I've always known that we would work together again, and then he, he came and shot this for me, and he's done the most amazing job, because, you know, like I keep saying, we were 13 floors up, and it was very difficult. <laughs> How's your vertigo yeah. now? Over. <laughs> really? You've embraced a lot of, maybe not fears, but challenges with this. Yeah. Um, but on Girls on Film, as you know, we celebrate female directors. Um, the statistics until quite recently have been quite woeful about women that have been given enough of a chance um, at many different stages of their career. Things are looking up because we've got Oscar-winning you know, female directors now, finally, and as we were saying, in, in, you know, in Cannes. Um, but do you feel, Kerry, that the climate is now a little bit more welcoming to you as a woman making a film than it would have been, say, 30 years ago? Oh, absolutely. I was thinking recently about what Jane Campion must have gone through when she started... Uh, making the sorts of films that she makes. And there's this terrible word that people in my industry use, and particularly use for actors and women, which is difficult. You're mm. difficult if you demand the best, if you demand excellent work, if you demand, and you work and work and work about how you want a result to turn out. You're labelled as difficult. Whereas that, to me, is just somebody working really, really hard. And so Jane Campion was out there by herself, striving to do her own work and her weird, quirky, perceptive, emotional, um, finger-pointy, in the stocking <laughs> in way. The piano, the yeah, piano? it's an amazing like, moment. Like, sort of perverse <laughs> and strange and... And she was really, really alone. I only realise that in, in retrospect now, you know. But I've worked with a lot of female directors. The last film that I was in that was in Cannes, in competition at Cannes, was the wonderful director Jessica Hausner, who's Austrian. And she is, man, she is sort of really <laughs> perverse. She's so specific and she, sometimes we would do 35 takes or something just because she wanted every single moment to be absolutely precise because of, the, of her vision. And so you had to completely give yourself over to, to what she was wanting. It's so nice to have a mature applicant. We have so many young ones. Any major illnesses? No. Uh, any operations? No. Psychiatric treatment? Yes. I spent some time in hospital in New Zealand. How long is some time? Eight years. How could you possibly think of being a nurse? What was the diagnosis? Schizophrenia. I'm sorry. No. It's out of the question. It's interesting when you say about the, the, the word difficult because I'm now very conscious that I never want to pass that on when people say in the industry, oh, she's difficult, he's difficult, and you can bet it's normally she. Yeah. It nearly always is that. And one of the things that really taught me that was the Harvey Weinstein scandal um, because a lot of people came out and said, well, the reason I was labeled difficult in the industry is because I turned Harvey Weinstein down. 
Or I threatened to report. I had my Harvey and meeting. And he spread this round. Oh, tell me about your Harvey meeting. I was just really boring and he was really fat and, and I just sort of thought, fuck, what is your fucking problem? It just sort of like, I felt my jaw drop all the time and he was trying to be really smart and cool and, and I just didn't think he was at all. And, you know, I just thought, you're not, you're just awful. <laughs> here, here, yeah. I'm not going to lie, when I met him I sort of felt that deep down but there was this whole kind of culture of complicity, wasn't there, of, of women just accepting it and because he was an important person and I hope that now that's changing and that's why I'm involved in Time's Up. But there is one recent trend, Kerry, which I think is a good thing, which I don't know if you think is a good thing and it's intimacy coordinators. Do people know what that is? Have you heard of this? So yeah, this is getting some nods. So it's someone that comes onto set and oversees the sex scenes or the intimate scenes and tries to make sure everyone feels comfortable comfortable, um, to make sure they all feel, you know, secure and that nobody's touching this, anything they shouldn't be. But you've been in some pretty racy films, Gary. How do you feel about this? Um, I have never worked with an intimacy coordinator, um, although I have done probably the most explicitly sexual scenes of any female actress on film. Um, and, and I think with the work that I did in Im intimacy with Mark Rylance and Patrice Charot, we changed the way sex was shown on film and that was part of our determination. We're, we're, once again, I was just so sick of seeing fake lovemaking, mm. fake interpersonal relationships, fake closeness, the sort of... What we were doing in intimacy had never really been seen before that point. Unfortunately, with that film, it was slammed by the critics here, but internationally it did well. I didn't well. slam it. Just as hands up, yeah, I didn't, didn't slam it. The men did. <laughs> Lots of people slammed it who hadn't seen it. That was that was. Quite oh, it was brutal. that kind of shock journalism, yeah. like, oh my gosh, real sex. But, you know, we won Best Film at Berlin, and I won Best Actress. Yes. The um, Silver <laughs> Bear. I couldn't go to the um, award ceremony because I was oh. nine months pregnant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a shame. That's what being a woman does for you. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so I, like I said, I've never worked with an intimacy coordinator. And, and I can understand that it is like being a stunt coordinator. We, whenever we do stunts, we always work with them. I don't, I've never worked in Hollywood in, a, in that sort of sense, but, you know, there's this swamping of you need the accountant, you need the lawyer, you need the agent, you need the manager, you need the intimacy coordinator. I mean, you know. How have you managed to stay far away from all that? Was that a very deliberate choice? Um, I think I've been very, very fortunate. Mm. Um, and I have, I ha I have uh, worked with a lot of women directors. Yeah and um, a lot of auteurs, and um, that has been a path that I have definitely chosen. Um, for instance, so if we can just move on to the Billy Piper film. Yes, um, Billy Piper, who's a fan here? Yes, so Kerry plays her mother in Rare Beasts. Carry no, on. can you imagine know, me you imagine? being... Oh, how can that be mother? possible? <laughs> I couldn't possibly <laughs> play her mother. <laughs> anyway, Very young mother. Um, I, I had met Billy on the final night of her amazing performance at the Young Vic of Yerma, which a friend of mine and a director I've worked with who's um, called Simon Stone had directed, and, and, and she just blew me away. It was such an extraordinary performance, and, you know, and, and I, I think she's, she's jaw-dropping me brave. Um, and that, you know, I, I just happened to meet her through an Australian friend. Those Aussies get everywhere. He was in the play as well. Anyway, um, and then uh, she asked me to play her mother and we just chatted over the phone. I was in Australia filming an, another great film by, written by a woman, an Aboriginal woman, woman called Topping, Top End Wedding. Um, and I spoke to Billy on the phone and, and I read the script and the script was like something I'd never read before. It was chaotic and painful and I thought it was so real. I thought, this is, this is like a woman's life. This is my life. I mean, Billy's character is my life. I'm a single mother with two kids. Most of that, I have been pretending that I've got a grip on things, but I'm usually just holding on by my fucking fingernails, trying to get it together, trying to keep the kids together, trying to keep them happy. You know, the, you know I, I've had a seriously ill kid for years, many years, five, six years, and just dealing with it and financially and mentally and, the, and trying to be an artist while doing that and trying to be a really good mum. And I just thought, or everything that Billy had written about 
was actually also my life. And I was, I was so... I, I, and also the way she'd written it, she was so brutal and garish. And I thought, people would read the script and hate it, like, wouldn't get it. And, and, and I just knew that I had to do it. And, I, and the really great thing which is so rare. I mean, you know, I read really great scripts and I love the films that I do, but it's very rare that the film that is made is the film that that director wrote. And she, she made the film she wrote. And I'm so incredibly proud of her. I just, I think that's, that's a great achievement. Welcome to my life. How long are you staying for? Indefinitely. We should go and watch people being happy. Every wife, respect your husband! I'm what you call a post 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 feminist. Mm, just an original woman. What is going on here? She used to be such a funny child. She used to write these little love letters and then offer them little death threats. I want to unveil myself to you one piece at a time so that I can talk you through what I physically hate about myself. You broke on Monday. What do you want? I want a five-hour day. You believe in heaven! I want to make stew that keeps. I don't need to make stew. What do you want? What do you want? I want a man. Man will send you mad, man. <laughs> Even though I feel scared and angry, I still love and respect myself. Kerry, what else are you up to at the moment? Oh, I'm, sometimes I never know if I'm allowed to say anything. Are you anyway, allowed? Oh. <laughs> I'm, um, oh, I've just made this really wonderful film by another film, female film director Yay. Uh, called Claire McCarthy. She's Australian, and it's about the... Um, once again, I'm playing a mother. Um, <laughs> of a, oh, no, I can't give that one away. That would be a spoiler. I can't say that one. Anyway, um, uh, it's about Clarice Cliff, who was a, a, a potter from Stoke-on-Trent in um, the late 1920s, and um, it was all deco pottery. She changed the way that pottery was made, and it's the, uh, the daughter, the Clarice Cliff character, is played by the absolutely divine and gorgeous and so beautiful, you just sort of want to lick her, is um, uh, a Phoebe Divener from Bridgerton, and ah. she's divine. Speaking of the last year and the weirdness, uh, how, how has that been for you in your industry? I haven't worked. Cause when I made the short film, I knew that I would probably have to take a year off working, basically. Um, but then that stretched into two. Wow, exactly. Yeah. It's been a crazy time. But I have to say, one of the, the weird silver linings for us, and obviously not to undermine the terrible situation, is that a lot of people have wanted to connect. And a lot of people have needed connection, and podcasts have become something that people have been able to connect through. So I would love to uh, introduce someone to the stage who is part of the Girls on Film team because Girls on Film isn't just me, it is a community of amazing women. So please welcome to the stage Eliana J. <laughs> Eliana's been working with us for about 10 months, producing, doing all sorts, but we thought it was about time we got you front of house. Yeah, it feels very weird to be this side of the microphone. <laughs> Normally I'm down the other end of a Zoom call, you know, <laughs> listening, camera off, muted, everything, but suddenly I'm on stage at Latitude. It's a bit of a weird, you know, turn of events, but here I am. Yes. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Promotion. You know what? I think it's surreal for everyone just to be here at Latitude. I mean, I don't think any of us really definitely thought it was going to happen until we actually turned up today. It's just, it's incredible. Uh, that's yeah. so true. You know, I, I came back from Cannes last week, so I've had seven different COVID tests to get here. <laughs> and I'm like, I know everyone's doing this. So yeah, it's an amazing thing to be here. But Eliana, obviously you are a young woman who is recently graduated and at a very difficult time during the pandemic. Um, how has it been trying to explore the film industry this past year? Yeah, it has been, it's been quite difficult. So after I graduated, I applied for a load of internships. Um, 
you know, all things I'd found online because, you know, when you want to get into the film industry and you tell the, the career zone or your school that you want to get into the film industry, the first thing they say is, why don't you think about advertising or marketing instead? You know, we don't have any materials about the film industry. That's, that's too hard. Don't do it. Wow, they still say that because they said that to yes, me. That's yes. mad. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, lots of researching. I found a load of internships, really hopeful, and then they all get cancelled because nothing's in production. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I spend a few, a few months just fig- trying to figure out what to do. And then I stumble upon the podcast because maybe things aren't in production, but actually podcasts were popping yeah. during, during lockdown, weren't they? So, um, yeah. yeah, and I've been doing the Girls on Film podcast since September last year. And uh, it's been great to try and get into the industry in a different way. It's not what I thought I would be doing originally. Mm. Um, but actually, it's been really, really valuable. Maybe I'm not in film production, but I'm, you know, going into the industry through criticism. But you're actually also... Pro- just explain. I think that people don't really mm. get how much is needed behind the scenes of a podcast. Can you just run through every, every person's input? Yeah, definitely. So there are four of us on the Girls on Film team. There's Anna Smith, myself. We've also got Heather Archbold, the executive producer, and Heather Dempsey, um, who's my fellow assistant producer and social media manager. All of us work together uh, to make the podcast what it is. So there's lots of emailing involved, finding guests. That's my favorite bit. Researching, finding those women out there who are either really popular and everyone loves, or the women who we feel are... their voices haven't been heard as much and trying to get those on the podcast as well. Um, And the women aren't always, you know, in the film industry themselves. Some of my favourite podcast episodes we've done feature women who are perhaps affected by the issues that are presented in films. So, for example, a recent one we did was on Promising Young Woman, the film, which came out at the the very sad time um, of the Sarah Everard vigil and, you know, her when everything was going on to do with that and it was a very sad time and we thought you know these two things the film and this can come together in a special way and we can make a podcast which is very thoughtful about this we so we invited on a police officer Susanna Fish an activist Amara Zena and a critic Leila Latif so we looked at all elements of the film and the context of the time we were in and I think that was just a very special way to look to look at that, to connect film to, you know, our experiences today. My assistant tells me that you're interested in resuming med school. I left under unusual circumstances. Huh. You remember the accusations made against Alexander Monroe? I don't. He took a girl back to his room. You know, we get accusations like this all the time. So it's the he said, she said situation. What would you have me do? Ruin a young man's life? (laughs) Was it reported? Yes. Do you know who she spoke to? You. I love that too and I think we did one on hustlers and we spoke to real strippers and I think again it was so interesting hearing from these women that were saying you know we see we see ourselves represented on film but when is it actually accurate and when do they come to us and ask us what our jobs are actually like and do we actually enjoy our jobs there's this kind of tart with the heart cliches and that sort of thing. Kerry have you ever consulted with you must have done consulted with someone who does what you pretend yeah mentally ill people a lot so how does that work how do you find so, them well, how do you speak with to them? an angel at my table i stayed in a mental hospital for a couple of nights how was that <laughs> and i it was really sad right and also I, I i sort of have experience of a lot of very troubled people you know and have a real comprehension of the workings of uh, a sequence, a web of reality. For instance, these people were diagnosed as schizophrenic, but it meant that the, the, the imaginings were incredibly complex. And actually, if you took the time to follow them and listen and work through, they were totally logical and airtight. And, and mm. so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a fair bit of that. 
And how does that then... Tra- oh, and I've been up a lot of scaffolding, obviously. Yes, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> now that your vertigo has all gone completely. I've been drinking with scaffolders. Can you knock off some shelves for me when, <laughs> when we get home? Um, but I want to sort of close by asking you both about tips for the industry, because there might be some people who are interested in getting into the film industry at some point here. Um, so first of all, Eliana, from your point of view, as someone that has managed to get some kind of a job during the pandemic, but also yeah. you're still speaking to producers, right? And you're still talking... Yeah. I mean, don't leave us, but I'm just saying. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still very much on my way in. I, I'm definitely not there yet by any means. <laughs> but I'd say from... I've been trying to get here from, a, from the age of 16, really. And I'd say, you know, gathering all that kind of experience together so far, be open. Don't narrow your choices straight away. Don't narrow your experiences too soon. You really want to be open to anything. So, for example, I wanted to get into film production, but along the way, I tried to work at a film festival. I worked at a cinema museum, which was one of the best things I've done, I think. I love the cinema museum. Um, I've, you know, joined a filmmaking society. Lots of stuff, now on a podcast as well. So, um, and then, so don't narrow your choices too soon. You want to get to, your. it's great to have a goal, but, you know, broaden everything before that you might find something else you actually really love and I would also say um, just be really open contact people reach out to people definitely email 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 that's very important yeah yeah Kerry, Kerry's okay there. right okay. these are these are my guidance rules excellent okay <laughs> got your notepads and pens out everyone Learn to make a really good cup of tea. The person who turns up with the cup of tea at the right moment, and it's a great cup of tea, hears all the conversations, (laughs) Ah. is brought into all the conversations, is asked, we're just having a really important meeting here about really important shit. Can you make us all a cup of tea? And then you hear everything. You listen, listen, listen. Make a really good cup of tea. Get your driver's license. And it's what you were saying about just being open, like don't be judgmental of other... Don't... don't yeah. I, I find this culture... Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, quite hierarchical and judgmental and classist. Yes. Try and knock that out of yourself. Just treat everyone equally and treat everyone as you would wish to yeah. be treated and you'll go far. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So I can't drive and I, I'm terrible at making tea. So I don't, it's a good job I'm actually on the broadcast journalism side rather than actually trying to be in film. But there's really good advice from you both. Um, any closing words for our Latitude audience? Because like Eliana, I am so excited to be here in this year when none of us knew we actually could be. And Girls on Film was actually meant to be on stage at last year's Latitude and of course it didn't happen. So thank you all so much for, for joining us. You know, it means a great deal to us. And we hope you all check out Girls on Film on all the platforms, Spotify, Apple, you name it. Um, but any, any goodbyes and closing words from Kerry? Oh, just have the best time while you're here and really try and remember every moment because it feels like it's going to be a really precious, precious weekend. Definitely. Eliana? I would just finish with maybe one more little tip. Do things that scare you a little bit. Not things that are dangerous or you're uncomfortable with because I think in a... In a post, like, hashtag Me Too era, you know, we can acknowledge that actually that culture of do anything, say yes to everything to get where you want. Actually, people can exploit that and take advantage of that. So there needs to be boundaries. You know, you need to not do things that make you uncomfortable. But what I mean by do things that scare you a little bit is, you know, the things that give you butterflies, that, you know, build your adrenaline up. Maybe like a festival, you know, mixing as we are now after the year we've had. I think that can be great and that can get you to great places. Well said. Thank you, Eliana. Thank you all for listening and watching to Girls on Film. Have a great latitude. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. See you around. I hope you enjoyed our latitude episode. We can't wait to go back next year. Hope you can join us. Girls on Film is an HLA production brought to you by executive producer Hedda Archbold, audio producer Tom Wally, and assistant producers Heather Dempsey and Eliana Jay. We'll be back soon. Stay safe. Accept my gratitude, latitude. (laughs) Um, That's been a blast.